The Crash of TWA Flight 800 Calamities Lesson 5 Jack O'Hara hated to fly. A TV producer for ABC Sports, he often drove to his assignments to avoid taking a plane. But in July 1996, he was asked to cover the Tour de France bicycle race. Since he could not drive across the Atlantic Ocean, O'Hara had to fly. As a bonus, ABC gave him two extra tickets. One was for his wife, Janet. The other was for his 13-year-old daughter, Caitlin. Jacques and Connie Charbonnet, on the other hand, loved to fly. For 21 years, they had flown TWA's Flight 800 between New York and Paris. Jacques was the flight service manager. Connie was the senior flight attendant. They enjoyed showing the ropes to new members of the crew. They were happy to hear that staffer Jill Z would be joining them for her first New York to Paris flight. Z, too, was pleased. She was so happy about being taken under their wing, said a colleague. Frenchman Marcel Dotti did not think about flying one way or the other. He was too excited. As a guitarist, Dotti had just been inducted into the country music Walkway of Stars in Nashville, Tennessee. He was the first person from France to be so honored. This was the greatest honor Marcel could ever have wished for, said his sister Martine Fournier. He was at a peak of happiness. The O'Hara's, Charbonnier's, Z, and Dottie all boarded the same plane, July 17, 1996. They were on TWA Flight 800. In all, the flight carried 230 passengers and crew members. There were 21 students from a high school French club in Pennsylvania. They were off to see Paris for the first time. There was a young exchange student going home. There was a mother who planned to tour old French castles with her daughter. She had overcome her fear of flying to make the trip. After a delay of more than an hour, the plane bound for Paris took off from New York's JFK airport. It was 8.19 p.m. The huge 747 climbed slowly through the night sky. It headed east over the Atlantic Ocean, just south of Long Island. Everything looked good. There was no sign of trouble. At 8.30 p.m., the pilot got his final instructions from the control tower. In the busy airspace near New York City, other planes were in the sky at the same time. Just after 8.30, the east pilot of East Wind Airlines, Flight 07, saw something alarming. We just saw an explosion up ahead of here, about 16,000 feet, he radioed. It blew up in the air, then we saw two fireballs go down to the water. There was smoke coming up from that. The pilot of an Italian airliner also saw the explosion. So, too, did a pilot from Virgin Atlantic. A pilot for United Airlines flew directly over the site. He reported the wreckage was still burning down there. It's bright red. There is smoke coming out. The control tower tried to reach the pilot of Flight 800 to find out if he had seen the explosion. There was no reply. Again, the tower tried to radio Flight 800. And again, there was no answer. A few minutes later, the grim realization began to sink in. I think that was him, said one unidentified pilot. I think so, answered the control tower. God bless him, whispered the pilot. National Guard helicopter pilot Chris Bauer was in the area at the time. He saw an orange fireball in the distance. It looked to him as though there had been two explosions and then a waterfall of flames spiraling down. At first, Bauer thought maybe two planes had collided. Then he moved in for a closer look. He spotted a man in blue jeans floating face down in the water. Bauer thought briefly about turning the chopper over to his co-pilot and jumping into the water. A second look, however, convinced him it would be a needless risk and a waste of time. The man was already dead. Moments later, the awful truth became clear. The young man was not alone. Bauer's flight engineer spotted many other bodies amid the debris. Flight 800 had exploded. All 230 people on board had been killed. Jack O'Hara had died along with his wife and daughter. So, too, had the Charbonnets, Jill Z, Marcel Dotti, and all the rest. Recovering the bodies was grim work. East Marseilles was the town closest to the crash. People from the town rushed out in boats to see if there were any survivors. Soon, people far away as Massachusetts joined the search. All they found, though, were dead bodies. Some of the victims were still strapped in their seats. Some had their clothes completely blown off in the blast. It was hard for many searchers to keep calm in the face of such a tragedy. Said Radney Penny, I tried not to get a good look at them, at their faces. I didn't have time to think about what I was seeing. We were out there looking for survivors. And by about 3 a.m., it became apparent there were none. 
Grieving family members and friends wanted to know who or what had caused the explosion. So, too, did everyone else. At first, most people suspected a terrorist attack. After all, it would not have been the first time an airliner was brought down by a bomb. In 1988, a bomb had blown up a Pan Am 747 plane over Scotland. A total of 270 people had died in that explosion. Or perhaps terrorists had used a rocket of some kind. A madman could have attacked the plane with a small handheld rocket launcher. Other people thought the disaster might have been caused by a freak of nature. For instance, a meteor could have hit the plane. The explosion could also have been caused by a mechanical failure. But the reputation of the Boeing 747 was so good that most experts at first dismissed that notion. Finding the real answer, of course, was not easy. The pieces of the plane were scattered over a wide zone. They were in ocean water that was 120 to 200 feet deep. It took a year and a half to recover the pieces and study them. At last, the experts announced their findings. The verdict surprised many people. TWA Flight 800 had not been caused by terrorists. The tragedy was not caused by either a bomb or a rocket, and the plane hadn't been hit by a meteor. It turned out the explosion was the result of mechanical failure after all. The 26-year-old plane's central fuel tank had exploded. Somehow, an electrical spark ignited a mixture of air and fuel. What exactly caused the spark remains a mystery, however. The families and friends of the victims were grateful for information about the cause of the crash. The fact remained their loved ones were gone. Sadly, no amount of information could change that.